Happy Halloween, my dear, dear friends. Well, I hope you're having fun tonight. And if you're inside, then I hope this story gives you all the chills that you need to have fun. <laughs> Do you dare join me in the basement of the hospital? Come on, I'll hold your hand, it'll be fine. Now, I'm going to need you with me for nearly 50 minutes this evening. Have you got the time to spare? I so hope you do, because I've got a story to tell you. Now, sit back and relax with your favorite drink, because it's time to listen. They lifted the dressings off of his stomach, and the hot throbbing inside spilled out, over his belt and onto the black jeans he wore, caked in blood and sweat. He screamed, as they had no means of rendering him further unconscious. The opiate dosage had already lowered his heart rate too much, in conflation with the loss of blood. The airlift had been fast, but not fast enough to save so much unnecessary suffering. Blood spilled down either side, beginning to collect in puddles on each side of the gurney they'd brought him in on. The middle-aged man, a fresh victim from a road rage incident, was yelling in pain. Occasional and desperate cries came coherent through the haze of fear and pain. He wanted them to call his wife, tell her that he loved her first and foremost. Other things about his children and asking the nurses not to touch them as they were forced to lift the guts away from his belt and take his pants off. The trauma shears had only gotten to the top of each pant leg, but the belt, firm and leather, remained. Someone needed to cut that out as well. Absently, I felt my hand go over my mouth, a hand in latex and a mouth coated with a medical mask. I stood behind and watched as the nurses and doctors ran emergency bloodlines into him. Phlebotomists rushing the red pints in their standard fair plastic packaging to them. They took his pants off. His member was exposed and the plastic wraps began to shield his viscera from drying out. The trauma room was the first line of defense in cases like this. But next would come the OR. The operating room. That's where I lost sight of the patients, and the real professionals begin their work. They worked fast, and hoped he wouldn't die on the spot. It had happened before. Shock was a silent killer in such cases, when more salient threats put a person's life in danger. It was still too much for me, though. The death was one thing, but the suffering was simply too much to bear. I ducked behind a curtain when no one was looking. When I'd heard stab victim 15 minutes beforehand, I hadn't expected this far-gone parody of a human being, a live one to boot. I had assuredly seen worse things in death, but the suffering of the live ones far superseded their gratuitous remains. Mostly car accidents. Those were the worst. Occasional gunshot victims, usually brought in from further out towards the city, where gang violence was more pertinent. Metal smacking flesh with ungodly Newtonian force was not pretty in any form. I stepped out of the trauma room, bereft and hyperventilating. I had never seen a man more in pain before him. The nameless man, whom I never even learned, would live or die after that day. The pungent stench of iron clung to me, even as I made tracks for the break room, tearing off my mask and pulling away my gloves. Volunteers shared one, whilst the RNs and doctors shared others. The reprehensible imagery remained. The contortions of the man's face. The heavy, slippery mess spilling waywards beneath. The things he said, begged the nurses and doctors to do. I was a veritable wreck as I fell into a couch, 
and stared blankly at the microwave sitting across from myself, along with a coffee maker and then a mini fridge. I sniffed a few times and cleared my throat, trying to forget the noise of the yelling, the decibel level of which the entire emergency room reverberated with. Everyone, staff and patients, had their collective attention turned to the trauma room, unable to see the pain behind the curtains brusquely pulled over. They obfuscated everything but the spills of blood and the cries of fear. I was careful not to cry in public, being one to adhere to male gender expectations, but I had come close that time. Alison had walked in and seen my strife. Though I hadn't made a sound louder than a breath, she could see the second-hand pain ridden all over my face, like the angry scrawls of madmen given pen and paper. Her name is a facsimile, as she requested. She had the esoteric means of calming me, and I always deferred to her assuaging words. Not many knew how to relax me, but she did. That's why we held on to each other. Though I'd met her months before, only now had she become more open, and I reciprocated. Why not? We had common masochistic desires. I mean, we worked in the same department, at the same hospital, at the same time. We tortured ourselves psychologically for the sake of helping others. At least, I had arranged for the same time. The worst place, if blood made you squeamish, was the emergency room. But we both felt we could handle it. I couldn't. I'd found out. But I didn't want to look weak in front of her. 8 p.m. to midnight, a late shift, twice a week, but it felt good to help the nurses help the patients. Cleaning beds was a primary task, but retrieving supplies from the basement was a crucial role as well. Blood and feces and urine were commonly left on our wipes and towels, but the work was undoubtedly fulfilling for the most part. She and I took care of each other in different ways. I had become a chest for her tears to spill over. She had become a voice and touch that understood what made me feel better. I spent the rest of that shift in the break room with her. She had run her hand through my hair maternally and moved close to me on the couch. Her warmth felt wonderful after I had become so cold. If death is a chill, then suffering is a blizzard. That was the first shift that week. I moved away from what I had seen. It wasn't easy, but Alison had been there for me. She rooted me into reality. My mind loved wandering down histrionic and irrational pathways when stress took hold. I had elected to come back for the second shift that week, and she was right there with me. We came and left together, and I was able to feel braver with her at my side. Though above the underground there was much chaos and pain, below resided something arguably worse. Suffering always had a cause, but the intangible force of uneasiness and physical chills never seemed to have one. There were always jokes and offhand comments about the basement. A lot of people died. It was a hospital after all. Nurses would ask returning janitorial and volunteer staff if they'd seen the ghost after return trips from the below ground. Doctors would ask volunteers to go downstairs and abscond with vacuum tubes or IV kits, not out of laziness or business, but because they were afraid of ghosts. They smiled and we laughed. Day, night, it didn't matter. Unless you got near the load areas, where semi-trucks delivered the supplies, you couldn't tell what time of day it was. There were no windows, or even clocks. Nurses, who were always exposed to so much worse, thought little of their brief and occasional visits to the basement. 
Most had never claimed they'd seen or heard what graveyard shift maintenance workers had. Their demographic consisted of Latinos, the type of men and women who wore crucifixes openly on tan chests and spoke only essential levels of English. What wasn't lost in translation in every complaint often fell on deaf ears. Superstitious, ignorant, even dumb. Words and slurs were whispered between the socio-economically elevated members of staff. They never believed it due to cruel and superficial reasons, a silent prejudice that no one dared voice, lest the divide between the racial demographics grew. I didn't like it, but Alison and I knew we couldn't rock the boat. She was particularly dissatisfied with the incredulity of those that didn't work in the basement area considering that she was 50% Latina. It wasn't everyone, of course, as it is with any respect of life. But a few gave bad names to the rest in both factions. She was friends with Carlos, a man who had given me permission to use his real name for the purposes of this memoir. In fact, he seemed eager to be a part of it when I suggested the idea to him. He was a jovial, eccentric man, stocky and hardened by many years of thankless labor. He had a large family, I'd learned. Four kids, a wife, and his mother all lived in a house closer to Los Angeles. He was almost always the supervisor during the graveyard shifts, which consisted of a skeleton crew of five other people. Four men and one woman. He spoke better English than them, which I gleaned from my interactions with the others. To preclude what comes next, I will inform the reader that the following encounters are solely Carlos's, not mine or Alison's. I will go further into detail about the experience Alison and I had later on. Carlos told me that it was generally believed that there was no one ghost that haunted them. He believed that souls who died in anguish or sorrow left stains behind. Angry, Violent and poltergeist-like, based on his descriptions. If you've ever seen The Grudge, that's a lot like what he spoke of. Carlos is a God-fearing man. I, myself, was raised in a Catholic household, but had later become a deist, actually due to my experiences in the emergency room. I didn't, after all, want to believe that God would allow suffering in such superfluity to reign free over a kingdom he supposedly had total control over. So, he was superstitious of ghosts and the like to begin with. He personally believed the devil had more control in places with high turnover rates of wounded and suffering individuals. He believes that him and his minions, the demons he also believes in, feed off the negative energy. <laughs> A standard fair belief for any non-skeptic. I remain neutral on the subject. And Alison, well, she was a skeptic. He told me first of the time that he'd been categorizing supplies in the massive storage area. It was a chilly, polished, concrete-floored room with rows upon rows of plastic, color-coded boxes holding ready-to-leave supplies and boxes that had yet to be opened. The aisles were twelve in total, and each row towered roughly ten feet high consistently. At the end of each aisle, you only saw the grey cinder block wall that surrounded the area on all four sides. Sometimes the grey was obfuscated by stacks of boxes forced to be stored against the walls in times of high demand, but usually not most of the time. The cool nature of the room was enforced to preserve perishable items like IVs and sterile dressings. Plus, its location made it convenient for air conditioning to be run between the morgue and the storage area. The two spaces walled each other, after all. I had never once seen Carlos wearing anything but a long-sleeved shirt beneath his smock and jeans upon his legs. Carlos told me that the chilliness in the room that night had seemed different. Not merely rolling along his clothing, but sleeping slightly in between the cotton. 
He used the word piercing to describe it. He found himself shivering, and his teeth had even begun to chatter. Something he had never experienced in the mildly cool room. The invasive temperature was a harbinger of something worse, according to him. The lights directly above him had begun to flicker. He had peered up from his clipboard to notice the fluorescent bulbs twitching and altering. He told me he had observed the other lights running down each aisle remain constant, not flickering at all. This anomaly perturbed him, but not to a point where he felt endangered. He had chalked the coolness to someone adjusting the usual air conditioning temperature and the flickering due to a faulty bulb. It was just coincidence that the one above him had begun to falter. Yes, another reason I liked Carlos. Though he was religious, he never acted irrationally or in idolatrous manners. Many like him were heavy-handed and thoughtless in their judgment, but not him. He then said he heard a box fall down at the end of the room. The entirely silent area, save for the humming of the air conditioning unit, had not been permeated by a gradual, changing, sliding of cardboard over cardboard. No, there had been silence, and then there had been the crash. Carlos was adamant to me of this point. It was not like a box had been poorly stacked. No, it had simply slid off. It was as though something had pushed it off, because he told me the noise was loud, as though the box was shoved with force. It was at this moment where he began to feel nervous. Though the notion of some dubious entity seemed silly in such a provisional status, the thought, he admitted, had serviced in the back of his mind at the moment he felt nervous. Being dutiful, he had sighed and holstered his clipboard, heading to the box at the end of the room and placing it back into its respective spots. It had occurred at the end of the aisle directly to his right, closer to the wall of the morgue. When he had turned around, he told me he had nearly jumped out of his boots when he saw something's leg disappear behind the end of an aisle towards the front of the room. He had been angry, and had become even more frightened, thinking someone was trying to scare him, someone not on his work crew. He told me this because the leg had been covered with black, and his workers were not permitted to wear anything but navy, blue, grey, and white. As he told me this part, I distinctly remember the hairs on the back of my neck standing up. Alison had been grinning at me, eager to see my reaction, since she had already heard the story. He had called out in Spanish and English, angry with whoever it was for trying to give the overworked man a heart attack. He had stepped into the next aisle, in the direction he had seen the person walking. There had been nothing in the next aisle. More vexed than frightened, he jogged down the remaining aisles, searching for where the person was hiding. There was only one heavy metal door that led into storage, and the piston that automatically closed it after it had been opened was incredibly noisy. He would know if someone had escaped. When he'd reached the end and not seen anything, he began to realize they must have been hiding behind one of the caps, what he called the ends of the rows of supplies. He ran towards the front of the room, hoping to catch the person off guard. Carlos told me, when he rounded the corner and had full view of the front area, his face had fallen, and the anger had been overridden by that same nagging nervousness. He told me that there was nothing there, no footsteps walking down the aisles away from him or anything. That had been his first encounter, several years before. With every story he told, I realized they would become progressively more unnerving. My recollection does his storytelling abilities no justice, but I will continue with the next occurrence he described to me.
It had been a few weeks after the first incident. Nothing had happened to him, but he had spoken with his workers. All but one of them had become worried of labouring alone in the storage room, and were asking him if they could start working in pairs. This early on, Carlos had refused, knowing that they would not finish their nightly work quotas if they didn't divide and conquer. A young man had quit not long after Carlos's refusal. He wouldn't speak to anyone about what he had seen, but his face had always been distant, a paranoid expression the night after he had supposedly encountered something in the storage room. It was an expression that was reminiscent of a person looking over their shoulder, thinking that something was watching them at all times. Carlos told me he felt bad about not agreeing to the idea in retrospect, but his younger self was ignorant of what the basement had to offer. At this point, he had only seen the leg, and he'd chalked it up to fatigue, or a trick of the flickering lights. Carlos, again, had been cataloguing the items in the hospital's inventory, and had noticed for a second time the lights only above him had started flickering. Now, his brain had been somewhat conditioned to become nervous at the sight. They had certainly not been flickering when he'd entered the room, he informed me. He looked around, tensing. He was waiting for the crash of a box again, but none came after he told me he'd waited a solid minute. He shrugged it off, ignoring the flickering over the paper he wrote on, and began peering into the shelves again, making sure each color-coded box was full and ready for the next day. The aisles were metal and see-through to the other side. Only the items on the shelves obfuscated whatever resided in the aisle next over. Carlos told me he had heard a shuffling to his left, towards the exit, and he had darted his head in its direction. In his recounting, he said the noise sounded like someone in loafers, sliding across a hardwood floor one little step at a time. There had been nothing when he looked, as he had expected. When he turned his gaze back towards his row, only then did he start to hear the running steps begin. He told me he had physically jumped and gasped in fear when he heard the steps race past the aisle just behind his current one. Through the boxes he had seen, concurrent to the steps, a pitch black thing racing towards the end of the room. A brief blur of something before it lost his eyes again. He had run to the end of the room, hoping to catch whatever it was, but as he had come to expect, there was nothing. This time he had not just shrugged it off though. He had gotten out of the room as quickly as possible, unlocked the door behind himself, not stepping foot in it for the rest of the night. He resolved to help his co-workers with mopping the areas around the elevators and blood bank, where the foot traffic was high, I was more bothered by the second at this point. I pictured myself alone in that giant room and shivered at the thought. Carlos, more jaded at this point, simply continued on to his next encounter. The third time was the worst. He had edified me. Two of his workers had called in sick, a man and the woman. He knew they fraternized, so he figured one had given an illness to the other. The two remaining men and himself were all in the storage area this time. After the second occurrence, Carlos had implemented a strict buddy system while categorizing and cataloging in the large cold room. One of his workers, Javier, whose real name I won't disclose, was at the end, sorting the many boxes of supplies that had been stacked at the time. He and the other worker had been chatting lowly over a clipboard, running numbers in each section. Both of them had looked up when, for a third time, the lights only directly overhead had begun flickering. Carlos had begun hyperventilating then, but he refused to run away. He felt braver with his men, but he still had a terrible nervousness in his gut. His co-worker, whom he stood with, 
who had not had the same experience he had, and had just looked to Carlos in a puzzled manner. Then, at once, every light in the room went out. The sudden darkness was supplemented by a scream, which came from Javier's location. Carlos and his co-worker had gasped, both sufficiently startled by the noise and the power outage. Carlos called to Javier in Spanish, asking if he was okay, but there had been no reply. The only sound that came was the cacophony of cardboard tumbling down over the concrete and the slipping of shoes that came in a loud squeak. Carlos had called out again, asking if Javier had been okay, but again there had been no response. He feared the man may have slipped and perhaps knocked himself out cold, but even at the time, he had told me the idea seemed far-fetched. He had never known Javier to be clumsy, but the sound of the spilling boxes was definitely telling. Carlos was trying to keep his cool in front of his co-worker, who he remained close to. The man had begun muttering prayers, a sound of abject terror in his cadence. Carlos hushed him and lowly told him to stay close as he looked for the light switch, which resided directly next to the door. They had heard more noises, something like a fluttering or flapping towards the back of the room. They heard groans and chokes. Carlos hurried up and finally reached the front wall. As he felt around, searching for the switch, his co-worker opened the door, allowing the light from outside to stream in. He had sworn, not liking that the lights had only gone off in their room though concurrently grateful that they now had at least some light. This did not, however, aid much. Only the first row was illuminated, and most light behind it was obscured by the many supplies it was lined with. Carlos had found the light switch in the slightly better illumination, but was terrified to realize the lights would not turn back on. Afraid and angry, he ordered his upright co-worker to get to the nearest phone, so he could dial the extension to the maintenance office. The man had readily complied, turning very quickly away from the room and bolting down the hallway towards the blood bank. Carlos, meanwhile, had turned back to face the darkened room, darting his eyes back and forth as though he feared something would jump out at him any second. He continuously called out Javier's name, feeling mildly reassured by the sound of his own voice in the completely silent room. He had great difficulty in discerning where he was going past the first aisle, so he clung to a sidewalk and gently slid his hands across it as he crept along, hoping he would hit the back wall soon. Carlos could only hear his rapid heartbeat in between each call for Javier to respond, to which none ever came. His hand ran over an anomaly in the black wall, and he quickly pulled back in fear, recognizing immediately what it had been. A hand also clinging to the wall. He had felt the nails and the fingers before he had pulled away. The pitch blackness before him seemed all-consuming, and his heart felt ready to burst from his chest as he almost screamed Javier's name. He knew Javier was standing right in front of him, but the accelerated decibel level was motivated by both his surprise and his anger that his co-worker had remained silent. Carlos had began scolding him and reached out to feel for Javier, but there was nothing. His anger swelled at this, and he began yelling and swearing for the man to come back. Javier had always been a little slow, but never so outwardly defiant or neglectful of his boss. Carlos felt where his hand had touched the other, and shivered between his yells. He was shocked at just how cold his subordinate had felt, almost like ice. He knew the room was cold, but there was no describing the sheer chill of the flesh he had ran his hand over by accident. His yells had paused only for the sound he heard across the room at the other side. 
Carlos told me he had slowly turned his head to where he thought a space between one row and the next was, and peered down, thinking he knew where the noise had come from. He called out Javier's name, more meekly this time, and again got no reply. A wind rushed past him, cold enough to shock Carlos into petrifaction. The temperature was so ludicrously unnatural, he told me that his bones felt as if they had been fused solid. His head had plastered itself into the direction of the space in between the rows unable to look away due to their sheer terror. Carlos had become noticeably quieter during this part. His demeanor took on an uncharacteristically furtive manner as he continued. He told me that he could see two glints at the other end, so far away it seemed, and they were tiny, like candles miles away in a black desert. He had only gasped, fearing so much what he thought they were. Their spacing and height was telling enough, but the fact that they were bobbing up and down and slowly swelling in size added to his paralyzed state. They were coming closer. They caught the scant tendrils of the light that poured in from the front. Carlos wanted so much to believe it was Javier, acting oddly, but what bothered him most in that moment is just how high he remembered the glints had been, much closer to the top of the aisle, as though Javier were two or three feet taller. Carlos had wanted to scream, to call for help, to do anything. The wind he had felt earlier had rendered him immobile, though. Whatever it was, Whatever was getting closer, he said, was pure evil. A malignant force, unthinkable in our brains, unseeable to our eyes. That's why he thinks it appeared to him only in the dark. His stupor, however, had been interrupted by the calling of his other co-worker from the front, along with the voices of several other men. Beams of flashlights penetrated the sheer darkness, and Carlos told me only then could he feel like he could move again. He didn't even remember if the glints had disappeared or not, but he didn't stick around to find out. He had turned on his heel and sprinted out of there at top speed. He said, and I quote, It was as though God was carrying me, carrying him away from the thing that he knew very well was not Javier. He had bumped into his co-worker, who had been looking for him, followed by two other men, also with flashlights and in maintenance uniforms. Carlos told me that, after that, it had been a blur, but what he remembered most was when they had found Javier. He was half buried under the boxes he'd been stacking. The grunting and groaning they had heard earlier, Carlos later found out from the paramedics that came down were the sounds of him having a seizure. Apparently, he had suffered an epileptic episode, and then promptly passed out, as epilepsy patients sometimes did. Javier came too the next morning, and told Carlos he'd only remember the lights going out, and then his body seizing up. That had confirmed everything Carlos had feared. He looked to me with those somber, almost uncanny eyes, solely because they were so antithetical of his usual cheerful nature. He looked to me and said he had never dared step foot in that room again, neither had the co-worker that returned with the maintenance crew, even Javier, who had essentially slept through the whole thing, was terrified to return. Carlos said that after that night, only the two that had not been there ever went back in, along with the new hires that trickle in every now and then. He recounted the young man who had quit, who refused to tell him what he had seen in there. Carlos believed he had encountered whatever had made the boy lose his grasp on reality. Oh, I remember, I remember 
literally vibrating after he had told the story. I had been shivering so hard that Alison had to hold my arms to help me calm down. As we sat in the lunchroom, Carlos gave me a wry grin and patted my shoulder. He told me it was nothing to be afraid of. It was probably just his imagination, his sleep-deprived mind playing tricks on him. But the look in his eyes... I couldn't place it, but it reminded me of the thousand-yard stare soldiers get after trauma. He was lying. Perhaps even to himself. That man, Javier, had been so utterly terrified, his brain had literally short-circuited. I couldn't even imagine that kind of fear. Even today. It's like Carlos said, though. What it had to be. Sleep deprivation. That's how he rationalizes it to himself nowadays, anyway. Still, the story chilled me. I never viewed trips to the basement in quite the same way again, even though nothing had ever befallen Alison or I, at least at that point in time, anyway. Either way, I gave the storage room a wide berth after those stories. Now, for what happened to the two of us. Alison and I usually worked in the ER, but when the business of accidents and hypochondriacs was slow, we were frequently sent into the basement to retrieve supplies, as I'd earlier stated. But there was always the occasional time when we stayed to help Carlos, out of decency more than anything. Plus, he always had good stories to tell, not exclusive to his experiences working downstairs. Though the basement had a claustrophobic layout, with narrow high halls, it spanned a considerable portion of the underground, in addition to a couple of loading bays, the morgue and the blood bank. To say nothing of the storage areas where Carlos worked. Hmm. Had worked. I hadn't even known there'd been a morgue until Allison had taught me. The very same day, we found what we feared lurked in the underground of the hospital. Allow me to explain. Trysts in odd places were not uncommon between the two of us. It was exciting, and kept each of us on our toes. When she gave me that look, she always had when she was in the mood. Or I grew unreasonably close. We didn't usually talk. We just did it. It happened in more than one place on the hospital campus, but never before in the basement, even before Carlos had told us his stories. But now, now it was dangerous, maybe even a little scary, but also endearing. If we could perform such lewd actions in the supposedly cursed place, I would have felt invincible. I don't remember how it started, but I do remember where. The men's room. One of the only two bathrooms down there. Seldom used. <laughs> yes, classy, I know. But you all know how it can be. Only after we were stepping out, and I was tucking my shirt back in as she pulled her pants up inside, she looked at me with a sly grin, and asked if I'd like to visit the mall. I told her I didn't know there was a morgue, and her grin only widened. Alison was always into scary things, hence her skepticism. No ghost, fake or otherwise, had ever frightened her. So, we sauntered into a hallway I'd never used before, closer to the back of the basement layout. We approached a white metal door, unmarked, and decorated only by a metallic keypad. I had hardly even noticed the door at the end of the cream white hall. It had been so well set into place within the threshold. There was no indentation as to where the door was placed, like all the others I'd seen down there. Only by the knob and the seam was it distinguishable from the rest of the surroundings, like they wanted to keep it well hidden. I was immediately off-put by the lack of labelling, 
but Alison had come near and asked me to place my hand over the door. I did so, and was startled by just how cold the metal was. She didn't need to tell me why it was so cold. That could be answered in one word. Preservation. I had stepped back and absently peered down the long hallway back towards the storage areas and then the elevators. I'd felt a chill go up my spine and felt the hair stand up on the back of my neck. Alison's arms, I noticed, were also covered in goose flesh. I asked her if she was okay. Her pupils were very large, I recall, usurping nearly all the light brown they were set in. She nodded, her lips pursing as she subconsciously grew closer to me. We both felt something. I'd never been watched by anything with a malicious intent for me before that moment. Thus, I'd never understood what the feeling was like. For the first time in my life, I'd realized just how unnerving that feeling could be. I darted my head up, looking to the fluorescent bulbs above but was mildly relieved to see they weren't flickering. Of course, it proved nothing, but Carlos's stories had taken a salient piece of my brain in that time. The corridor was more foreboding than I'd remembered, as we tacitly proceeded back through, passing the morgue's doorway and nearing the closed door of the storage room. We shuffled closely together. I remember taking a somewhat defensive stance in front of Alison. She didn't complain. The fear was becoming voracious as we neared the grey door. My only recourse as we passed was the fact that the door was locked on that particular day, for reasons I was never told. Thankfully, there had been no noises or anything so robustly terrifying from behind it. I think both her and I sighed quiet breaths of relief after we exited to proximity. Directly ahead of us, the hallway turned left into the central room the elevators opened into. If you were to proceed straight, you'd have to squeeze past a black, plastic custodial dolly to reach the electrical room just past, thus ending the dim corridor. It was always there, and was always filled with miscellaneous cleaning items and chemicals. The two of us both knew there was no reason to remain down there any longer. We'd seen all there was to see on that particular night. Entering the central room, I reached forward to the elevator panel and pressed the button to go up. At the time, one of the elevators was out of order, and only one operable lift was available to us. As the button glowed red, signaling my call had been confirmed, I looked back to Alison, and she'd smiled to me. We'd let the nerves get the best of us, and had fallen to mass hysteria, it seemed. There was nothing down here that wanted to hurt us. As I was shrugging off my worry, and Alison was starting to taunt me for how scared I'd seemed, I heard a beep come from the device before me. I shot my gaze away from her playful teasing, and up to the floor readout above the entrance to the sealed door. I exhaled sharply, and silently cursed when I realized we'd have to wait a bit. Someone was already taking the elevator to the second floor above us, and we'd have to wait for their trip to end, and then the car to return all the way back down. I nervously laughed at this, and Alison had ceased her speech to look behind herself towards the way we had come. I asked her what was wrong, and she took a step back, closer to me again. She mumbled that she thought she'd heard something. Already unnerved by the length of time the lift was taking, I began to spam the button a few times, hoping to extricate ourselves from the basement more quickly. All in vain, I knew. Mashing the button would not help. I darted my head into the direction she was looking, keeping my ears open for any noise. The tee off into the electrical closet route at the left and the morgue on the right was displaying something anomalous. Something that caused my breath to reach hyperventilation levels. All the bulbs along that corridor, around both corners, were flickering. 
Alison had cried out gently for me to hurry up, but I saw that the lift had only just reached the second floor. I stared on, past my shaking beau, who had now backed shamelessly into me. I could feel her heartbeat even through her back. It was like a machine gun. There was a squeak from the left corner, where the electrical closet resided. Not like a mouse squeak, but lower. Almost like something mechanical. The ubiquitous white was permeated by the briefest glimpse of the janitorial trolley, peeking a smidgen of its mass just around the corner. A mop positioned upwards on it fell down with a loud clang of wood on linoleum. Alison had simultaneously yelped and jumped, and I yanked her back as I heard the elevator continue to beep behind me. We were practically hidden in the metallic threshold plastered into the sealed doors. I briefly moaned in fear, filled with a dread I had never felt before, and haven't felt since. In those moments that preceded, I feared so gravely that some amalgamation of darkness and uncanny appearance would waylay us and do something unspeakable. The descriptions Carlos had given of what he had seen raced through my mind as we pulled ourselves as far into the metal as humanly possible. I caught the short glimpse of the lights in the central room just begin to flicker as the doors finally opened behind us and we practically fell inside. Allison raced to the panel and repeatedly slammed the door close option, finally completing our route from whatever was down there with us as the door sealed and we headed back up. For the sake of brevity, I'll say, we scarcely went down there again after that, and never at night. This has gone on for quite a while, and suffice to say we were both scared out of our wits. Both she and I had felt the uncanny hopelessness, the cold bite of something intangible seeping into our beings every moment we remained down there. Though she never openly admitted it, I knew Alison retracted her parochial opinions on the existence of ghosts, or not. Now, I apologize if that was not as exciting as Carlos's recountings, but that is what we experienced on that fateful night. I felt that it was worthy of sharing with you all. Okay, that's it everyone. Stay safe. Well, hope you enjoyed that Halloween special, everyone. Oh, I'm quite exhausted. Takes a long time putting a 50-minute story together, I can tell you. Well, regardless, I'll be back with you on Wednesday and Friday with more stories. Now, from now on, Wednesdays are going to be my uh, Dr. Creepin Extreme days. So, uh, something a little bit nastier, perhaps, every Wednesday from now on. But I will warn you, I promise, after last week and uh, things got a bit gnarly, I'll make sure to let you know before the video starts if it's going to be a bit more bloodthirsty and a bit more gory, okay? Okay, my dear friends, that's all from me for this evening. Hope you'll join me again soon. For now, bye-bye.